Well, we're, um, we're going to get started today. Um, we're, gonna, we're getting back to our series. What's our series? It's in Ephesians. It's talking about not only our position, but our practice. And we're going to talk about uh, what God has to say to us today. But I want to show you something pretty interesting. If you have a, a phone, if you have an iPhone like this, uh, it's kind of interesting. There was a, a, a friend I had got an iPhone for the first time. It was a woman. I won't say that she was technologically challenged, but she was technologically challenged. But anyway, so when she first got her iPhone, she couldn't see anything. I can't get it to work. It's on. I don't know what it is. It's black screen. Well, if you, if you pull down right here, it can make it get dimmer. She made it so dim she couldn't see nothing. And she goes, it's a black screen. I can't see nothing. Oh, well, you just go like this and you just do that. And then it makes it bright. It makes it bright. You know, um, I want to talk a little bit about some things today. Um, but I think that's an interesting little uh, illustration of what God wants from us. Uh, you know, some of us, we, we are bright for God. Some of us are very dim. And which one are you? And we're going to get into that in just a few moments. You know, uh, when we left off last week, we talked about the fact that we are beloved children of God. He keeps reiterating our position. And, and now that we are saved, we should be what? We should be imitators of God. And in some very specific ways, he talks about how we need to be displaying this supernatural love to a lost world, to show forgiveness to a world that probably can't comprehend forgiveness, not only that, we should be different in our walk and in our talk, uh, no longer participating uh, with those who do not know Christ in some of the immoral behavior that was very common in their day. And he said right in verse 7, he says, Therefore, do not be partakers of them. And that's very clear from um, everything that he is leading up to, that he wants us to be different. That's what he wants. And... Uh, then he says these words. Look what he says here in verse number 8 of chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you can follow along. He says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. It says in that verse, in verse 8, that as new creatures in Christ, we are what? We are light in the world. We don't just possess some light. We are light. We are the light for the world to see the light of the world. We are the light of the world to show the light of the world. Jesus said this to his disciples, right? Remember in Matthew chapter 5, he said, You are the light of the world. Guys, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. As Christians, we've been given many titles. We've talked about some of them today. One of them is forgiven. Right? But we're also called believers. We're called saints. We're called children of God. We're redeemed. So many different titles. But here in this passage, he has another one that I want you to embrace. He says that we are the light of the world. So if that is the case, and that is the case, if you're a Christian here today, then you need to, Paul says, live as children of light. And, and so today I want to talk about how you can light your world. I want you to embrace that title. You are children of light, so I want you to light your world. That word light, when you think of the word light, it can be used as a noun, an adjective, or it can be used as a verb. You know, a light is a thing that produces illumination, right? A candle is a light. Uh, a flashlight is a light. It produces illumination so people can see, right? But to light is to shine that light. We are, we are in, in the verb form here. I want you to light your world. I want you to shine. It says uh, that um, we are lights in the world. And so um, I want you to, to be able to be visible to the people around you to a world that's surrounding you. So um, that's, that's really our, our calling here. Um, I, I thought maybe there's an illustration of this that you could just kind of wrap your arms around because Jesus says, I am the light of the world too, right? I mean, Jesus said that he is the light of the world, but 
But here he's telling us to, that we are the light, right? It's kind of like a picture of the moon and the, the, uh, the, the earth. You have, you have the moon there and the sun and the earth. And, and so we are not the ones who actually produce the light. We are a reflection to illuminate the light of the sun. When you see the moon in the sky, you wouldn't be able to see the moon in the sky unless the sun reflected off of it and illuminated the moon so you could see the moon. And that's why we're able to see the moon. And so God says, you know, I want you to shine for me. I want you to be a reflection of me. Like you talked about earlier last week about imitators. Here he wants you to shine a reflection of him. And what does that light look like? Paul gives us some very specific things in this passage that he wants us to really hone in on. So if you look, we're going with verse 9. This is the fruit of your light. You were formerly darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of in all, what? Goodness and righteousness and truth. Three attributes. Three attributes he, he, he puts down there. Those who walk in darkness, you know, it says that, um, um, if you go, go on in verse, let me keep going, it says, Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. You know, it's really interesting. The, the unsaved they have the unfruitful deeds of darkness. So in other words, um, there is no fruit in the dark. Darkness bears no fruit. Their life is a fruitless life. And... It says that their deeds bear no fruit. At least nothing that will last, that will be valuable. But, but that's not the case for us, not us. For those of us who live as children of light, our, our light has certain qualities that are life-giving. And Paul says these three that we just read, right? Goodness, righteousness, and truth. The first one I want to talk about. This is, I, I, this is uh, our calling is that we as Christians, we need to shine the light of God's goodness, his, his love and goodness to a hurting world. I don't think we realize just how powerful it is when we show goodness. Goodness is the personification of love. It's love practiced. So when we perform these small acts of kindness, and there needs to be some intentionality about this. Isn't that true? Goodness is love in action, and it's practice in our kindness to one another. There are so many little things that you can do to shine the light of God's goodness. All it takes is a little bit of time, something we're not always willing to give, right? It's a shame that this fruit, this fruit of goodness, is in such short supply because it doesn't take a brain surgeon. It doesn't take the smartest person in the world. It just has, takes someone who cares. That's all it takes. And we can change all of this, uh, this inequity of goodness by, by living it out. Just think of all the people that you know in your life who need light, this light of love, who need a touch from someone to show them that somebody cares. And uh, how hard is it to make a phone call? How hard is it to pick up the phone and just ask someone, hey, how are you doing? Hey, I just wanted to get caught up. What's going on in your life? Just to show that you're interested. How hard is that? You've got your phone with you 24 hours a day anyways. You might as well use it for something good instead of just watching TikTok. TikTok and Micmac and Facebook and whatever else you got on Instagram. It's great, right? But you could actually do something that will redeem the time by calling to encourage someone. How hard is it, though, to even go one step further? Is it really that hard to stop and visit someone who's all alone? You know, there's a lot of people who live by themselves. Do you realize there are so many lonely people all around us who are just craving for the human touch? They walk around and look at the walls, and they're like going bonkers. Because we are, we're made as social beings. So loneliness is a huge problem. And we have the ability to give this authentic expression of goodness and love to people. Very simple. 
hey, I just wanted to stop by. I was thinking of you, and I brought you some flowers. Wow, wouldn't that blow their mind? You just were driving in the street. You know, I was thinking of you, and I just want to come by and say hi and bring you some flowers. Wow, they would probably, they're, they're, they would, if they didn't faint, their jaw would drop at least. Right? Now, is, is that how we uh, illuminate to the world? Is our life so consumed by the Holy Spirit in our life that, that his love just oozes out of us? It just overflows to those around us. Is our light shining in such a superficial love that when people encounter you, they know that what you have is real? This is not phony. He's not just being nice to me. He truly cares about me. This is, this is what people need to know, that you truly care. Then he goes on. What else? We also need to shine some other kind of light. Not just goodness, but he also, sometimes there's another kind of light. We need to shine the light of God's righteousness. That's what it says in that, that, in that verse. Does the light that we, ex, that we shine expose the deeds of darkness? I wonder why, why is it that Christians don't speak up when they see injustice and evil in a free country. Now, I can understand some people say, ah, I just keep to myself, I mind my own business, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say nothing, that's their problem. But as Christians, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to speak for those who don't have a voice. If we are the light of the world, we need to shine the light of righteousness into this pagan culture. And it's gonna take some courage. You know, we, we have to, and, and it's not because we want to beat them up about it. We want to shine the light so we can show that their ideologies are leading them to a dead end and warn them because we, we understand how destructive it is for them to continue in their practices. So we're, we're actually doing the most compassionate thing by speaking out about righteousness. The Bible does say, though, speak the truth in love. So if we, if we herald God's righteousness, God's standards of perfection, God's intrinsic perfections to a lost world, they might not agree with us, but at least they'll respect us if we say it because we care. If we're going to say it and saying you're a bunch of losers, then he, we kind of lose the argument. We kind of lose our high moral ground. And what, what we're trying to see here is that we need to be the light that shines righteousness so the world will be, will be forewarned about the dangers of their, of their behavior. It's actually compassionate for Christians to speak up. If we are the light that shines righteousness, then people need to hear our voices. You need to actually say something sometimes. One of the reasons that um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer didn't survive the Nazis during World War II was because he refused to be silent. He could have just been quiet. Sometimes there is a cost to being children of light. But just think about this. How many pastors just sat by idly as countless atrocities occurred all over Germany in these concentration camps? Nobody in this universe can convince me that all the pastors of the churches in Germany, as well as their flocks of Christians, didn't know what was going on. We're totally unaware. We were just completely bamboozled. No, of course not. That so few people spoke up. And that's really an indictment. Or how about in our own backyard? Yeah, I know Germany. Let's make fun of the, the Germans in World War II, right? How about, did you know back on January 21st, there was this event in Washington, D.C.? There was a very important event that took place, and you probably missed it with all the other noise that comes out of that city. You probably didn't even know what was going on, but unfortunately, not much intention was given to this event, and it's called the March for Life. How many people even knew that this event was taking place? I mean, it's right on the schedule. The March for Life was held, and it was there just like it was every year. It was held to protest what? to protest abortion and plead for the precious unborn lives that continue to be slaughtered across our country and to give some voice to the voiceless. 
to just protest, to say this is wrong. And it was barely mentioned in the news, right? And despite all the cold weather, still tens of thousands of people showed up. There used to be hundreds of thousands of people that showed up to the March for Life. So over the years, it's kind of gotten a little bit smaller. But you know, they've had that march every year since 1974. The, the same is, can't be said, though, of the consistency for us. The vast majority of Christians have really failed to speak out for these helpless lives. Do you realize that for 48 years without fail, they've had the March for Life, and yet most Christians have never attended it? It's a small little sliver of people that says, it's important enough to speak out about something that is so horrible. Seriously, I think the church has gotten so used to sin and evil that things that we once found to be appalling to our senses barely elicit any emotion in us at all. It's a sad indictment against us that we do not speak up for those who need a voice. Um, but there's one more on the list. I don't want to make you feel horrible. This is our opportunity to change the equation, to shine. And so we can shine the light of goodness in this world. We can shine the light of righteousness, but we can also shine the light of truth. And I hope that is what we will always be about. And where does truth come from? There's only one place where we can find absolute truth. Not just your truth or my truth, like Oprah Winfrey says. This is the truth. This is absolute truth, right? And it's right here in God's word. Jesus himself said what? He said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. This is, this is how we understand a clear reality of what's going on in the world. There's a lot of different opinions people have. This is how you know the truth. It says in Psalm 119, 160, it says the sum or the entirety of your word is truth. Everything in this is truth. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. It hasn't gotten outdated. It's still truth today. Everything that's here is for our good. The world continues to preach other messages. And the world that listens has been deceived. And we need to expose, by shining the light of truth, the lies that are being told. We need to read it, we need to know it, we need to memorize it, and we need to proclaim it. People need to know what God says. Most people don't even know what God has to say about a topic. Back in verse 11 that we read earlier, he tells us, have nothing to do with the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather do what? Expose them. We need to expose people to the truth that to show them that there's an alternative to the darkness and to shine God's love and God's righteousness and God's word to this lost world that needs desperately answers. They need answers. If you go on in that passage in chapter 5, he describes the darkness. He says, it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Paul says, I would blush. I can't even, I don't even want to say it. You know the kind of immorality that's going on in your city. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. You know, people never deal with their sin. They never deal with their lost condition until they're exposed in their own soul to realize that they need a Savior. If you don't think that you're bad or you don't think you're that bad compared to the guy next to you, you'll never look for Jesus. So we need to expose the vacant lostness of our world and how sinful and how lost we are because we failed to meet God's standard of perfection. And that is why he said, verse 14, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. He says, wake up. <laughs> Be, goes on, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. He says, people are watching, you can shine for them. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. 
Today, while there's still time, we need to be shining for Christ. We need to make the most of every opportunity, every time we intersect in the lives of an unbeliever. They need to see light. They need to see the light of goodness and righteousness and truth. And we need to be an embodiment to model for them an alternative to what they have been told their whole lives. Remember what Jesus said as he closed. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Do you know how he goes on in that passage? He says, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. Do you see the foolishness? We have so much to offer. It wouldn't it be silly to take a light and put a basket over it to cover it up? That's what we do. He says, you have so much to offer. No, we take that light, we put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Just think of how wonderful and fragrant your life would be when you enter a world of darkness with the light of Christ. This wonderful truth that we have. And he goes on at the very end, he says, so therefore, this is Jesus, let your light Shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They said, look at that guy. There must be a God. Look at that woman. There must be something to what they are talking about, about this Jesus. As we shine the light, we're going to reach a desperate world with the wonderful message of grace. We get an opportunity. We get an invitation to tell them why we're different. And we can tell them the wonderful gospel of the grace of God. So go on, get your light shining. And then when you get the opportunity, open your mouth and tell them the truth that Jesus saves. Because that's what they need to hear. That's what this whole world needs to hear more than anything else right now. And so that's your challenge, Christians. And if you're not a Christian, then let me shine the light of truth to you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the truth. If you want Jesus, if you accept Jesus and trust him as your Savior, the Bible says that you will have everlasting life. Jesus said that anybody who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Wouldn't you like to know this, Jesus? Let me shine a little light on you. God says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you believe that? That's the truth. That's the truth. Let's pray. Father, there's so much that we cannot see because we are not looking. I pray, Lord, that um, you would help us to seek your face and to See who you really are. And then I pray, Lord, as we continue to grow as Christians, I pray, Lord, that we would shine to a world and show them what makes us different and really demonstrate the power and the influence of salvation in a life that's been touched by your spirit. Lord, I thank you for this time. Send us on our way with this wonderful truth. In Christ's name. Thank you.